As many of you have heard by now, the state of Texas has loosened many of its COVID guidelines. To be honest, that really doesn't affect us too much as a church. They'd already loosened those for us early on. And so we will, for the most part, keep things pretty much the same as we have been doing them. What it does do, though, is it's risen up this conversation uh, up to a higher pitch than it has been for the last few months. Uh, I know that to wear a mask, not to wear a mask is one of those things that people disagree about, even within our church body. And so our ongoing policy about masks has been we recommend that people wear masks. Uh, so we have them available. If somebody hasn't worn them, uh, we offer it once, and, and, and that's kind of the way we handle that situation. But we also respect people's uh, right to not wear a mask. And so if somebody doesn't feel comfortable wearing a mask, uh, we let them do that as well. Uh, we need to remember that uh, although Scripture gives us some guidelines on how to make decisions like this in our lives, there is not one right Christian way uh, to think about this matter. There are Christian ways to treat one another, though. I think Philippians 2 is a wonderful passage to show us Jesus' character. Uh, and particularly, as Jesus came to earth, that was a humbling experience for him. And as he died on the cross, definitely a humbling experience for him. And so Philippians 2, starting verse 3, tells us, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than yourselves. Let well, each of you look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Uh, so just to be clear, if you think that you need to wear a mask, then I want you to look out for the interest of those who think that they do not need to wear a mask. Try to understand their perspective, the way they're thinking about it, and then even if you don't understand it, go out of your way to love them. And then if you think that you don't need to wear a mask, then, then I want you to think about those who do think they need to wear a mask. Try to understand their perspective. And even if you don't, go out of your way to love them. That's a way that we can be abundantly loving as the body of Christ, because that is much more important than anything else. That we treat each other with love and respect and kindness. Now, the one change we will have is on March 21st, when we open up for Sunday morning Bible study, uh, we will also take the tape off that's been separating every other pew. Well, we still ask you to sit with your family uni units. We still ask you to try to find uh, some spacing between you and the people around you. Uh, try not to sit right in front of or right behind somebody, but kind of separate each other. And it makes it easier to see anyway. But we want you to be here. We want you to be a part of worship. We want to come together uh, around the one thing that matters the most, the worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
Man, Dallas just told me you're supposed to perform that song a whole year ago. Can you imagine? <laughs> this year's been a blur. I can't even remember what's all happened in the past 12 months, but man, I know we got to, a lot to look forward to in the days ahead. Amen, church? So um, let me apologize real quick because somebody's about to come give the welcome. He's a new guy around here. He's real shy about being on the microphone, so y'all encourage him. This is Pastor Al Perry. Thank you, Matt. If you're visiting with us today in the auditorium or you're watching from home, we'd like to welcome you to the uh, services of South Park Baptist Church. I want to suggest that if you're maybe looking for a church home, that you don't consider this church. You don't consider this church if you're looking for a church that does not have a wonderful nursery where your children are loved and cared for in modern facilities. You don't need to join this church if you're the type of person that's looking for a church that does not have a wonderful children's ministry under the direction of Tricia Smith and her wonderful workers Amen. that will love your children and have wonderful programs for them. You don't want to join this church if you're looking for a church that does not have a wonderful youth program under the direction of Matt Riziki that teaches your young uh, people how to be wonderful, godly leaders of tomorrow. You don't want to join this church if you're not looking for a church that has small group Bible studies that teach the Word of God and prepare you to go out into this present world. You do not want to join this church if you don't want a pastor like Chad Bertrand Amen. that preaches spirit-filled messages uncompromisingly that will be your shepherd and will walk with you in the good times and bad times. Faye and I have been members of this church since 1964. If you're looking for a church that I described the last few minutes, you want to join South Park Baptist Church. And I can assure you that if you join as members that have been members since 1964, you will do as we have done many times. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God at Amen. South Park Baptist Church. Amen. One last thing. To prove to you that I believe in what I'm saying, if they and I have an, ever have another baby, <laughs> we're going to put that baby in the nursery at South Park Baptist Church. <laughs> Let's just, let's just take up the offering and go home. I think, we, I think we're done, man. Oh, hey, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Pastor Al. I'm ready to worship the Lord this morning. How about you guys? Let's sing about the greatness of our God. Why do you turn into wine? Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you There's none like you Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you There's none
voices to him now. Water you turn into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. There's none like you. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. There's none like you. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. And if he's for us. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Oh, I could stand against. Our God is greater. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Oh, our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise this morning. Well, it's funny, Pastor, I had mentioned a song. We're actually going to sing part of it today. Um, Back in the church I grew up with, we ended the service like this every single Sunday. I think you already know what I'm talking about. It's a song called Family of God. And, and man, the m music minister made us stand up and stretch out and hold hands. I, we're going to forego a lot of that, y'all. <laughs> you can spiritually hold hands with the person next to you, um, but we want to sing that wonderful chorus. That, uh, we're, we're joint heirs with Jesus, right, as we travel this sod. And then we're going to go right into asking the Lord. Uh, this, this song is a prayer that you prepare us to be a sanctuary for him this morning. Let's sing together. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this song. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. Sing that again now. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this song, for I'm part of the family, the family of God. For I'm part, for I'm part of the family, the family of God. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, prepare me. Oh, Lord, prepare me to be 
morning. Heavenly Father, we, we come confessing that you are great. You are awesome. You are a God who is worth all of our worship and all of our lives. May we live for you and for you alone. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before I get started this morning, Al 
uh, you've, you've been studying the Word of God for a long time, right? Yeah. So, uh, you remember the story of Abram and Sarai, right? And, and you remember the story of Elizabeth and Zechariah. I'm just <laughs> careful what you, what you promise um, this morning. God has a way of blessing uh, people with babies when, you yeah. uh, know. So growing up, uh, it was easy to define who was good and who was not, right? Uh, the people who are good were the people who don't drink, smoke, or chew, or go with the girls who do. Right? Or if you're Baptist, you don't dance. Uh, either way. And now I find that that definition of good is a whole lot harder to come by, isn't it? It seems like anything goes to come with good. Now, the problem with both of those definitions is what? We made them up. We were the ones who decided them. So one is pretty narrow, one is pretty broad, but they're both definitions of goodness that come from us. And when we defined good for ourselves, what do we usually do? We, we usually try to put us in the place that is good, and then sometimes we want to keep other people in the place that isn't good. But we look at Mark chapter 10 this morning. Jesus has a conversation with a rich young man, and we'll find in this conversation in Mark chapter 10 that probably all of us should get out of the defining good business. And it's probably not our definition to make. So we get to Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 17, and it says, And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except for God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all of these from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. He said to him, You lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. On the outset, this man's pretty impressive, actually. He comes to Jesus. He makes sure that he catches Jesus before Jesus heads out of town. He comes before him, and he kneels in front of him. And he comes to him, and he realizes that he is a good teacher. And he realizes that this is the one who has the answer to the question that I have. Where will I find eternal life? How do I get eternal life? And so this man, out of all the people in the gospel, he knows what he wants, and he knows where to find it. He knows Jesus is the one who can give him this answer. And so this starts off as a pretty promising encounter between Jesus and this would-be disciple. But then the conversation begins. It begins like every other conversation. How do we have conversations? We, we greet one another. Hi, how are you doing? Good. Great. How are you? It's a rote conversation, isn't it? Even if you're not good, you have that conversation. That's why in different languages, what's the first thing you learn when you learn a new language? Hola, como esta? Muy bien, gracias, y tú? I can have the whole conversation with myself, right? I don't even have to know what I'm saying. You just know the right things to say because the conversation goes the same way. Bonjour, ça va, ça va bien? You can have these conversations. I can have conversations in all kinds of languages that I don't really know because that's what you learn, right? You learn how to say hello. There's a custom, there's a pattern to it. And so this man's coming to Jesus, and he's following a custom. He's following a pattern. It's not quite the same as the rote conversation that I just had, but there's an expectation here. There would have been an expectation. I come to you and greet you, and I compliment you. And so what's expected? I'm expecting a compliment in return. That's how this conversation goes. Everybody knows the pattern in this day and time. 
So this man comes to Jesus and he says, good teacher. So what do you think he expects to hear in return? Well, good sir. He, he expects to hear a compliment in return for his compliment. But what does he get? And he doesn't get a compliment. He gets a challenge. And so instead, Jesus comes to him and says, well, why do you call me good? Oh, God's the only one who is good. So think about this in that man's head for a second. He's coming to Jesus. He's saying, good teacher. He's expecting to hear, good sir, in return. Instead, he's hearing, no one's good except for God alone. And nobody is good in this world. This man was coming to Jesus counting on his goodness, counting on Jesus recognizing that he is a good person too. Uh, I'm with you, Jesus. I'm in the same category as you. I'm a good person as well. But what this man doesn't realize is that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us are good on our own. None of us can make it on our own. And so he starts off this conversation, and he's probably derailed a little bit. This isn't going the way he would expect it to go. Uh, but he asked the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus answers it for him. He comes to him and he says, well, have you kept all the commandments? And he lists the last six of the, the ten, right? The, the ones that talk about how we live in this world, the ones that everybody can see outright. And so have you kept the commandments, you know? Uh, and we might be with them on the first part, Right? Uh, do not murder, we're probably good on that one. Uh, do not commit adultery, hope we're good on that one. Uh, and do not steal, those are, those are the easy ones, right? Except for what does Jesus do with those? He ups the ante on those, especially the first two. It's not just don't murder, but don't be angry with somebody. Uh-oh, we're probably all in a little bit of trouble now, right? I, I thought I was good, but now I don't know. Uh, don't commit adultery, and Jesus says, well, don't, don't even look at somebody lustfully in your heart. Well, I thought we were good on that one. And then we get to the, the rest of them, right? Don't lie. Oof. Right? Don't defraud somebody. Don't take advantage of somebody in a business deal. I, I think he slipped that one in instead of coveting here because of who he was talking to. Honor your father and your mother, right? But what does this man say? Oh, yeah, I'm good. Got him. All of them. I'm done. Yeah. He's sticking to his plan, right? I'm a good person. I need to keep being a good person. I've done all of these since I was young. I mean, we, we look back at when we're young, and we're like, oh, man. And back then, I'm even worse than, well, maybe. Who knows? Um, but I have done all of these things since I was young. He sticks to his guns. I'm a good person. Now, had he done them 100% of the time? Probably not. Or, or is he thinking, you know, I do these most of the time. I, I do them more than I don't do them. My good things outweigh my bad things in this world. I mean, that's how we think about it sometimes, isn't it? Uh, we, you ask our culture around us, and that is the general understanding. If I do more good things than bad things, then I am a good person, and I will get to be in heaven forever. I mean, that's the conversation this guy's having, isn't it? Good teacher. What must I do to have eternal life? And he's expecting, well, you are a good person. So yeah, of course, you're in. You're done. You've done the right things. You're going to have eternal life. You're good to go. But is that how it really works? That's how he thinks it works. That's how many of us think it works. But is that how it really works? No, instead, we find Jesus coming to this man and he says to him, well, actually, before he says anything to him, he looks at him. He looks at him. And when Jesus looks at him, he knew him, right? When you see somebody, Jesus didn't just see him. Jesus saw him. Jesus saw into the depth of him. Jesus understood him. We'll figure that out in a second here. He knew him deeply. And then the next word is that he loved him. 
So he saw him fully for who he was, and he still loved this man. He deeply loved this man. Actually, we find in the book of Mark, this is the only person that it says that Jesus loves. The only one in all of the book of Mark is this man. Jesus loved him. And so when Jesus loves him, what does that mean? It means he wants what's best for him. Absolutely and completely, he wants what's best for this man. So we hear these next words from Jesus in that context. He knew him completely. He loved him fully. He wants what's best for him. And so he says, you, you're missing one thing. One thing you lack. Go, sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. So what's the thing that this man lacks? Is it generosity that this man lacks? Is it sacrifice that this man lacks? Well, th those are all important things that come into the conversation that Jesus is having with him. Uh, but he doesn't outright say the one thing this man lacks, does he? Well, because what is really the thing that he is missing? The thing that he is missing is Jesus. The thing that he's missing is right in front of him. He is missing Jesus in his life. He's missing letting Jesus be in control of his life, being the Lord of his life. He wants Jesus to be his Savior. He wants Jesus to give him eternal life, but he doesn't want Jesus to be in control of his life. And so he is missing out on the God that truly loves him, the God that truly knows him. That is the thing that he is missing. And so what does Jesus do? Jesus says, well, if you want to know me, if you want to follow me, then, then these, you need to do these things. Not that he's trying to earn something. Not like if he goes and sells his possessions, then he has paid his price for his sin. That's not the thing that he is missing. And no, this is a fruit of following Jesus, right? And so it's not selling to earn it. That would go back into this guy's plan to begin with. It's a demonstration that I am willing to give up everything, and I am willing for you to be in control of my life. And so that's what Jesus is looking for for this man. But he knows him, doesn't he? Remember, he saw him. He knew the thing that would stand in the way of this man coming to really, truly follow him. He knew that his money and his possessions were the thing that would get in the way of everything. And we might say, well, Jesus, that wasn't really fair, right? Why are you making them choose between money and you? Is that really a fair choice? Well, if you are around my age, a little bit younger, and you're married, uh, you, you've got a new problem in this world that generations ahead of ours didn't really have. Video games. I don't know how many conversations I've had with married couples my age and younger where video games became a problem in their marriage. I'm not going to single any gender out, but the guy would always play video games and not spend time helping out around the house, not spend time with his wife. Not, he would be so consumed with video games that he didn't spend time with his family in his marriage, right? I mean, we, we could throw in social media in that conversation too if we really want to step on everybody's toes, but how many times do other things stand in the way of our relationships, right? And so I'm not saying video games or social media are bad things, but when they are in the way of a relationship, you've got to choose which one goes, right? And so what Jesus is saying to this young man is, your money's standing in the way of this relationship. Your money's keeping you from the thing you need the most in this world. See, Jesus is standing there right in front of him, wanting a relationship with him, wanting him to know him, wanting him to follow him. And Jesus is the one who will, is come to this earth so that we can have eternal life, the one who has come to this earth to die on the cross to pay the price for our sins, the one who realizes we're not good but is willing to pay the price so that we can still be in the presence of God. He's standing right in front of him. Jesus, who rose from the dead, 
so that we can have full abundant life now and life forever with God is right there. All he has to do is realize that all these other things that he's holding on to aren't worth it. But what does the scripture say? Disheartened, he went away sorrowful because he had a lot of wealth. He had all the potential, didn't he? But this is a tragic man in Scripture. He knew what he needed. He knew where to go to find it. But when it was there for him to have, he wasn't willing. I I think it's probably significant that Jesus didn't ask him about the first commandment. Have no other gods before me. Uh, Because I don't know about the rest of them, but I know for sure he couldn't have answered that one. He had let other gods come between him and the one true God. So we have to ask ourselves, don't we? Is, Is Jesus asking us to sell everything we have and give it to the poor? Is he asking us to be willing to give up things in order to follow him? Uh, I mean, this is pretty hard, isn't it? Uh, But the truth is, yes. Yes, Jesus is asking this. And, And actually, in that day and time, it would not have been as uncommon as we might hear it today. And it's probably not as uncommon today as we might expect it to be, is it? The Qumran community, a Jewish community that kind of went out by the Dead Sea and said, you know, we're going to kind of get away from everything. They're well known to us today because of the Dead Sea Scrolls. If you wanted to be a part of that community, you gave all of your material possessions to the community and y'all kind of all shared with one another. There was this self-giving for the sake of the community and it was a pietistic thing. It was because of their belief in God that they did these things. But it's not just for communities out by the Dead Sea. What did the early church do? The early church lived by the mantra, what's mine is yours. Uh, we, we find in Acts that they would sell houses and lands and they would give it to the poor. They would give it to help take care of other people. They were a people of generosity. It, it was a hallmark of the early church to be generous with your wealth. I think it's the realization that everything we have isn't really mine, but it's God's to begin with. And then we fast forward to our day, and we look at people in awe, don't we, who live this kind of lifestyle. I mean, how many of us would say, you know, Mother Teresa, man, she was willing to give it all, wasn't she? Not only did she dedicate her life to be a nun, not only did she go to India as a missionary, what did she do when she was in India? She decided she couldn't live in the convent anymore where she was taken care of, where life was fairly comfortable with the convent and the private school next to it. No, she decided that if she was going to help the poor in India, she needed to live among the poor in India. She really gave everything she had for the sake of this mission that she was on, to care for the poor and show them the love of God. And we look at that, and we were a little bit in awe of that, But we have a God who wants us to live the same way, to realize that what we have really isn't ours, that He is in control of even our possessions, that they are His. But we also have a God who sees us, right, and knows us. He might know that money is not the thing that stands in the way, and that might scare you a little bit more, isn't it? Because he knows what does stand in the way of your relationship with him, of you truly following him, of you truly giving your life for him. Yeah, I might not say it out loud this morning, but you know it in your heart this morning. And he's asking for that as well. Whatever standing in the way of you giving your life to him, he wants it. Why? Because he loves you. And he wants what's best for you. And he knows if you go after some other things in this world instead of him, those are not the things that are best for you. Those are not the things that give you true, full, abundant life in this world. And he wants what's better for you. And it just so happens that he is what is better 
for you. And Jesus is what's better for you, not just because he gives us hope for future and eternal life someday, but he wants life for you today. He wants to change your life today. You see, we see that this isn't just a story for this rich young man. It's a story for us as well. The passage goes on in verse 23. And Jesus looked around and he said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them, Children, how difficult is it to enter the kingdom of God? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. They were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. So when this man walks away sad, or when he leaves this offer of eternal life, Jesus turns to his disciples and he talks to them about this thing. And he said, it is difficult for people who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. It is difficult for rich people to come to believe in Jesus. And they're astonished at this. They're taken aback at this. And to understand that, I think we need to see that for a lot of Jewish people, they saw the presence of wealth as the blessing of God. We kind of see it today as well sometimes, don't we? We equate people who are well off with people who have been blessed with God. Actually, we use the term for somebody who is good. Probably when you were in elementary school, you used the term goody two-shoes. Anybody use that term or is it just me? Uh, we called somebody who always did the right thing in class. Oh, he's a goody two-shoes. Well, that, that story comes from a fairy tale of a young uh, orphan girl who only had one shoe. But she was a delight. She was always good. She was always doing the right thing. And she walked around town with just one shoe on. Well, one day, a rich man saw her one shoe, and he bought her a pair of shoes. So she went around town bragging, I've got two shoes. I've got two shoes. And she grew up, and she became a teacher. And then she married a rich widower. And everybody around town said, see, she has been blessed because of her virtue and her goodness and the things she's done in life. We equate goodness with material blessing. And so that's how they thought. And so they're like, well, if rich people can't come to God, the people who've been blessed by God, then who can come to God? That's their perspective at this point. Like, man, if they can't, then who can? And Jesus ups the ante a little bit, doesn't he? He says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich person to come to the kingdom of God. Camel is the largest animal in the Palestine, Palestine area. A, a needle is the smallest hole that you can think of in that area as well. And so he's saying, you're trying to cram the biggest thing into the smallest thing. It's not going to work. And now, just to take care of the elephant in the room, I know you've probably heard that, well, I have the needle's a gate, and Jerusalem it's a low gate, and if the camel gets on its knees, uh, I wanted to dispel that a little bit this morning. There's no such gate in Jerusalem. You go back to history, you go back to archaeology, there, there is not a gate that exists. If you've used that example, don't feel bad. It's been around since the 11th century, right? Halfway between us and Jesus, this thing came into existence. It's been around for a while, um, but uh, there is no camel's gate. The reason I want to dispel that a little bit is... When we do that, we're making it a little easier, aren't we? We're taking what Jesus said and we're saying, oh, well, it's not as hard as what he says. No, it is as hard as what he said. It is not possible for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. And I think it's important that it's not possible. It's not possible for that camel to make it through the eye of the needle. And it is incredibly difficult 
for somebody who has great wealth to come into the kingdom of God. Why is that true? Well, we can take care of ourselves. We've got a bank account. Uh, if I need something, I can pay for it. If I don't have the need to depend on anybody else, I don't want to depend on anybody else. It's hard for a rich person to pray, give me this day my daily bread, because I think I provide my own daily bread. And in case any of us don't think we fall into that category, I want you to think about this for a second. In this world, the poverty line is $1.90 a day. All right? And less than 10% of the world lives on $1.90 a day. Well, take it up a little bit. 25% of this world lives on $3.20 a day. Or it's right now, like COVID time. $3.20 a day. A quarter of this world lives on. $5.50 a day. 40% of this world. 3.3 billion people in this world live on $5.50 a day. I, I know that there are some struggles. I know it's not always easy. Uh, I know that, uh, that there is poverty, and we need to address that, and we need to take care of people here, right? But in comparison, man, even those who are hurting among us, even those who are in need among us, compared to 40% of this world's population, I mean, they are, we are doing well, aren't we? And so we think about these things, and we look at these things, and we see Jesus is talking to us. He's not talking to them. He's talking to us. And the question is, are we going to truly hear him? Well, good news. Good news is when they are astonished, when they ask the question, who can be saved? What does Jesus say? God's in the business of making the impossible possible. But what we can't do, God can do. We can't put a camel through the eye of the needle, but God can do it, right? We can't save ourselves, but God can save us. He's in the business of saving people, and that's what he does for all of us, rich or not. We can't save ourselves on our own. We can't come to God on our own. But he makes that impossibility possible through the death of Jesus on the cross. And Peter hears all of this and, and he realizes, oh, wait, 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 wait. No, no, you're right. Because we've done that. We've given up everything. We've looked at those stories in the weeks past, right? They left the boats. They left their family. They left the tax booth. They left everything. They didn't let anything stand in the way. And they began to follow Jesus. It is possible because Jesus did that in their lives, and Jesus can do that in our lives as well. And so Jesus ends this conversation by saying, yeah, and you'll get paid back. And sometimes we think about this like Job, right? He had everything taken away from him, and then he got everything given back to him. But, but I think what Jesus is talking about when he said, you've lost father, mother, sister, brother, but you're going to gain it all the more. I think he's talking about the brothers and the sisters who are sitting next to you this morning. He's talking about the community, the family, the church that we get to be a part of. Well, we, we might lose family, and some people do lose their family when they put their faith in Jesus. They disown them. They don't want anything to do with them anymore. But the thing we gain is this family, a family that's built around Jesus Christ and our commitment to Him. We gain the church, not, not just the church gathered here, but the church gathered around the world. We gain a new family and we get what that rich young man was looking for, don't we? We get eternal life. We get life changed by God here and now. And we get life with God forever. So the passage ends, many who are first will be last. Right? So some of those who are first in this world will put their faith in Jesus. Some but many who are first won't, right? Many who are first will be last, and the last shall be first. So the question we have this morning is, we have a God who sees us. What does He see in you? 
And what does he see as a barrier between you and him? And you have a God that loves you, that wants you to be in the group that knows him, the group that goes from last to first, the one who gets to have eternal life in him. The question is, when you face this offer, will you accept it? Will you walk away sad? Heavenly Father, let us see what you see. As we look at ourselves, show us if there's something standing in the way. Show show us if there's something we haven't been willing to let go of yet. Help us to be able to face that squarely with our lives. Lord, with your grace and your help, help us to be able to let go of those things. And Lord, help us to be overwhelmed by your love. A love that costs you everything. A love that took Jesus to the cross on our behalf. Help us be overcome by that love today. Help us to be drawn in by your love today. Help us to live in that love this week and share that with those around us, those who desperately need to know you and your love in this world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you don't know Jesus, or maybe you've heard about him your whole life, but you haven't been willing to truly follow him. Thank you so much for joining us online for worship today. So you just saw the announcement. We have a few changes coming, but I want y'all to know for sure we will still have our live stream services each Sunday as well. Uh, you need to respond anyway to this week's service. Uh, please email me at chad at southparkchurch.net, or you can give me a phone call at the church office, 281-331-3902. I'd love to talk to you more about putting your faith in Jesus Christ or if you want to join this church. However you need to respond, I'd love to talk to you more about that. Uh, We have some wonderful things coming up for Holy Week. Holy Week begins March the 28th. Uh, You can look on our Facebook page for some announcements on that or a weekly email as well. But I want you to know that we will have two services on Resurrection Sunday morning, one at 9 o'clock and one at 10.30. We'll live stream both of those as well, so if you want to join us in person or on live stream, those will be available to you. Now as we go this week, let me leave you with this benediction that we find in Second Peter. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and in the day of eternity. Amen. In glory, glory, we have no other king but Jesus, Lord of all. of sin's tyranny My life is hidden beneath heaven's shadow Your crimson flood covers me Your crimson flood covers me Glory, glory Lord of all, we raise the anthem, our loudest praises ring, we crown him Lord of all.